All right, on to some more important things. I have to ask a very important question this morning. Are there any golfers in the room? Okay, Scott's willing to at least put a wrist-type hand up. John, I mean, come on, you work at a golf course. How could you? Oh, Larry. All right, we're getting more honest and more honest. Well, I'll tell you this. Based on the quality of my play and the location of my clubs at this point in time where they've been for the last however many years, I personally would not call myself a golfer. I would probably rather simply say I at times have attempted to golf. Okay, but those details are left for another sermon on another day about being honest, all right? Regardless, those of us who have at one or more times picked up a set of clubs, one word rings loud and clear in our ears. Mulligan. Mulligan. Right, John? Mulligan. Now, to a golfer, a mulligan is a blessed thing. A mulligan constitute a do-over. A mulligan constitute a fresh start. When you take a mulligan, the previous stroke, what you did before, no matter how atrocious, no matter how horrible it was, it's as if it is no more. It is gone. It is forgotten. And that is a wonderful thing. Now, let's carry this over to our daily lives. Our daily lives. How many of you have had one of those days that that started off bad, proceeded to worse before breakfast, by lunch had magnified into horrific, by dinner had expounded into absolutely awful, and by the time you went to bed, you were having pleasurable thoughts about possibly not waking up the next morning. Anybody ever felt like that? Please, there's more honesty there than there is about golfing. Absolutely, I have been there. Would you agree with me then when you have had those days or a day that if you had the power, if you had the power and the ability to exercise a mulligan that most of us certainly would, a do-over on that day? Well, now let's transition that into our spiritual lives. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand on this one, How many of you have ever had one of the days we just talked about, but it was in regards to your spiritual life? You felt as bad as you did on that day when your physical life just went to pot. How many of you, and I know I can raise my hand and say I have, would credit that day to maybe one or two areas in your life that you maybe just continue to struggle with, right? That that, that area in your life that the Bible says easily besets us, as the King James says. Maybe it is the area of pride. Maybe it's the area of worry or anxiety. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's submission. Maybe it's patience. Maybe it's corrupt communication that you struggle with. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe you are not as consistent as you want to be in your prayer life and in your daily Bible reading. Whatever it is that besets you, wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't it be great if the next time you fell short in whatever area you fall short in, instead of beating yourself up, wouldn't it be awesome if you could just exercise a mulligan? Well, I have some great news for you. And it comes from God. It comes from His Word. According to Him, we can. Amen? We can exercise a spiritual mulligan. Open up your Bibles to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. I've been trying to have the scripture verses up on the screen because I know it helps some of you all. And especially as we're flipping rapidly through scriptures. We had one this morning, but for technical difficulties, we're not going to have it. So I know several of you have mentioned that you enjoy having the scriptures up there. Hey, looky there. Nathan has proven me wrong once again. They are up on the screen there, but I hope you are turning to them in your Bible We're going to be looking at verses 22 and 23. Now listen to me. The prophet Jeremiah wrote this book. And as the prophet himself was writing this, he was writing it to a group of specific people. He was writing it to the children of Israel. And he was writing it to them during a time when they really needed hope. He was writing to them in anguish himself. Because of the children of Israel's sin, you now found a very small remnant of them. Because much of the nation of Israel had been destroyed, you found a remnant of the children of Israel in exile, in captivity, in a place called Babylon. And this is when Jeremiah wrote this book in anguish, and yet trying to give them 
hope, a hope that rests in the promises of God. Well, let's start with verse 22, and this morning I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It says this, The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. Can we just stop right there and say amen? Right? The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. His mercies never cease. Isn't it great to know that we In God's eyes, his mercies are new every morning. Isn't it great to know that we can exercise the spiritual mulligan? Now, before we go any further in the message, I need to clarify something. I need to clarify something very important. Uh, John can back me up on this. A mulligan is not a part of the official rule book of golf. It's not, is it? It's not an official part. The mulligan in golf is more of what I would call a gentleman's rule. And in my limited play, very limited play, if you saw me play, you would say why I limit the times that I play. In, in my limited play, and as I have played with other men who have golfed far more than me, a mulligan is a gentleman's rule, and usually you get about one, or you should take one mulligan per game. Now, I also have to tell you a fact. When it comes to professional golfers, when it comes to the Masters and the U.S. Open and the British Open, all They don't use mulligans. They aren't allowed to use mulligans. You say, preacher, what are you saying? Well, we need to thank God for his mulligans. We need to thank God for his mercy. But we do not need to make it a practice to live our Christian life mulligan to mulligan to mulligan to mulligan. In fact, as we move upward in our spiritual growth, in our walk of sanctification, as we are becoming more and more mature Christians, as we have talked about in the entire book of James, we should be exercising fewer and fewer mulligans. That is the mark of a truly growing Christian. A a Christian who, who claims to be a Christian and who lives a life where he just justifies his mulligans over and over again, a Christian person who claims to be a Christian who lives a lifestyle where he says, well, and notice I said lives a lifestyle, makes it a practice to say, well, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is permission. I would encourage you, if that's you, if it describes the way you live, to really check the condition of your heart uh, because though God offers mulligans, praise the Lord, right? He does not want that to become our lifestyle, living from mulligan to mulligan. Now, With that clarification made, we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning examining, I guess what I would call the procedural use of that spiritual mulligan. We're going to examine what it means to take a fresh start. And that is what I've entitled my message this morning. It's one of my favorite messages to preach, especially around New Year's. I know we're almost done with the first month, but we're still fresh into the year. And when you think about a new year, you always think about that fresh start, right? You may have made some mistakes, you may have gained some weight, you may have done something in that old year, but now you've got this new year where you can have a fresh start. Well, that's what it is with that spiritual mulligan, and that's what we're going to look at today. And I want to give you some tips, or I want to give you some help remembering this. And so we're going to use an acrostic this morning. We're going to take the word start, S-T-A-R-T, and we're going to go through it, and we're going to be looking at what God has for us in regards to this spiritual mulligan. We'll begin with the letter S. In the correct procedural use of a spiritual mulligan, you have to S, stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. The New Living Translation states Proverbs 28, 13 like this. People who cover over their sins will not prosper. But if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. For anyone to try to cover over your sin is to justify. Trying to justify. You're trying to excuse your sin. Sin can never be justified by us. Therefore, anything regarding sin other than a true confession of it and a true repentance from it is nothing but making an excuse. And we're good at it. Let me give you some examples. Oh, you know, I had to kind of fudge those numbers at work. It's a mistake that would have cost me my job. Oh, There was only partial nudity in that movie. Ah, 
Only five times did they take God's name in vain. That's well below my limit. Yeah, I lost my temper. I got angry and I said some things that I shouldn't have said. But hey, I was only reacting to what that person did. I was only reacting to what that person said to me. So they caused it. They're the one in the wrong. Oh, I wasn't gossiping. No, those, that group, they, they needed to know all the juicy details because that's the only way you could have effective prayer. You go to the Lord, you've got to have all the details to tell the Lord. I think you can see where I'm going. We could all probably play out our own scenario in our own mind of the excuses that we have made. That's not how we deal with sin. We stop making excuses. 1 John 1.9 says this, If we confess our sins... If we confess our sins. Do you hear anything in that verse that says anything about if we make excuses for our sins? No. It says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The fact is the verse says nothing about making excuses. We simply must confess regardless of the consequences that may come. Consequences follow sin, especially when we try to cover it up. But even if there's going to be consequences, I tell my daughters all the time, you need to admit when you've done wrong. You need to confess your sins. Don't let Satan use the fear of consequences to keep you from confessing your sins. You have to confess. You've got to obtain God's mercy through forgiveness. We have to admit our wrongdoing. No matter how much we may be humiliated when we confess our sins, we must humble ourselves and admit that we've done wrong. We must confess our sins, and the confession must come from a truly repentant heart. Repentant means to turn. You have a heart, a spirit inside of you, the spirit of God, that when you, when you sin, it's more than just doing something wrong. When you sin, you have disappointed your heavenly Father. And your desire should not just be to tell Him that you've done wrong, but when you tell Him, you should have a desire that says, Father, I want to turn. That's what repent means. I want to change my mind and my position about this sin. Let me back that up with Scripture. Psalms 34, 18 couldn't be any more clear. It says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. That is what it means to stop making excuses. Well, we've got to do that. But then we also have to T, the second letter in in start, take stock of the situation. Take stock stock of the situation. Now, I have to admit to you, I know you're going to be shocked that I fall, that I sin. I mean, I know that is a shock to y'all. Um, thank you, Miss Hazel. I, I laughed too when I put that in there. When I sin, I'm usually very quick to go to the Lord with repentance and forgiveness. Here's the problem I have. And you can ask my wife, she would back this up. There are a lot of times when I have a real hard time Letting it go, forgiving myself. I I have this mindset sometimes that, yes, I know God has forgiven me, but I'm going to have to pay a certain amount of penance or go through certain types of of discipline or, or ramifications until he's going to let it go totally. Can I tell you what the Bible calls that in the New Rob Vernon translation? Fooey. Fooey. That mindset is foolishness. Psalms 103.12 makes it clear. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Here's what it means for me to take stock of a situation when I have messed up. Here's what it means for you to take stock of the situation as you have sinned. That's the first thing. To admit, I have sinned sinned. The Holy Spirit convicted me as a child of God. I had the Holy Spirit in me who convicts me when I do something against God. I'm taking stock. Lord, I've sinned. Your Spirit has convicted me. I have come to you, not with an arrogant heart, not with an excuse 
filled heart. I have come to you with a broken heart, a contrite spirit. I have repented. I have confessed. God, you're keeping your promise now. You have forgiven me. I have been cleansed. I have been made clean. My sin has been removed from me. Hear me. My sin is gone. Period. Amen. Doesn't mean the consequences are always gone. Doesn't mean the ramifications of the sin are gone. What it means is when I come to him with a contrite spirit, humbly, I can take stock of my situation knowing that my God has promised that my sin is gone and it is gone. Church, so many times in my life, and I've seen other Christians' lives, we paralyze ourselves. We paralyze our effectiveness for the kingdom of God. We paralyze ourselves around what God has for us to do out of the attitude of this. Oh, I just can't forgive myself. You're right. You can't forgive yourself. God can and God does when we follow the correct procedure for asking for his forgiveness. We have to stop whining about not being able to forgive ourselves. We have to stop being paralyzed as a Christian because of false guilt that comes. You say, Pastor, what's false guilt? Well, let me explain to you what it's not. False guilt is not conviction. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit who lives inside of each and every genuine Christian. Conviction is when you do something wrong or don't do something right. Same thing, by the way. And the Holy Spirit begins to stir in you saying, you have done wrong. You have disappointed God. Okay, that's conviction. We should listen to it. Stop making excuses, repent from a contrite and broken heart, and then we are forgiven. But guess what? Once you are forgiven, once that sin has been removed as far as east is from the west, guess what? Any conviction you feel about it, if you've truly repented, is false guilt. That false guilt comes from Satan, who wants to paralyze us. That false guilt is, uh, is uh, intensified by our flesh. We have to realize that we are forgiven. We have to realize that he has gotten rid of our sin. You want to know the most of the reason why? Because he has. He has told us in his scriptures. They are gone. That is part of taking stock of the situation. But here is the other stuff we need to do. What have I learned? What have I learned from this situation? Not glorifying sin, not spending my time thinking over and over about my sin, but I need to think, God, what can I learn from this failure? God, what good can come of this? You know, according to the word of God, specifically the story in Genesis where Joseph said, look, God God took something that was intended for evil and he turned it and used it for good. God can do that. So we need to ask him, Lord, what good can you bring out of this? Lord, let me take stock in my failure. Let me take stock in my sin. And let me develop a plan of action based upon your word that can help me from avoiding this next time. How do I avoid what happened next time? Especially if it's one of those consistent sins that we just mentioned. We need to come up with a game plan based upon God's word, his power, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Kind of walk backwards from the sin and see how did you get there. And let's devise a plan to keep us from repeating that failure. How can I use this experience? How can I use my failure to help others? You realize that, right? God forgives us. God comforts us. God is our Father. And He does that for us so that we can reach out to other people. Maybe you have a friend or maybe someone in the church who's struggling in a similar area that you used to struggle with. And you're able to come alongside them and put your arm around them. Another reason why God doesn't want us to do this on our own. That is what it means to take stock of the situation. And if we truly take stock of when we mess up, Most of the time, we are going to see how God, for his glory and for our good, this is wonderful, takes our messes and turns them into his masterpieces. Amen? You understand, right, that there's no mess in your life that you ever turn into a masterpiece. You understand, right, that if you are in a mess, 
and by the glory of God or for the glory of God and by the power of God and by your relationship with God, that is the only way it gets turned into a masterpiece. But isn't it awesome to watch God? Think back in your life right now to some messes that you have been in and the Lord has just turned them into a masterpiece. It's a wonderful thing. Amen? Well, we've seen we need to stop making excuses. We've seen we need to take stock of the situation. And now the letter A in the word start. We must act by faith. Act by faith. In a fresh start, we got to act by faith. Why? Because Hebrews 11.6 makes it clear that that is how we please God. What is faith? Well, the New Living Translation, Hebrews 11.1 1, answers that question about what faith is. What is faith? Faith is the confidence that we hope for. Faith, it is the confident assurance of what we hope for going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. Let me read that again. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. Now turn back with me to Lamentations chapter 3. And let's reread our text this morning and let's add verse 24. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. By his mercies, we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. This verse lets us know. You want to know why we can have the assurance of hope? You want to know why we can be absolutely assured of the hope? Not because of our action to hope, but because of what our hope is on. The foundation, the solid foundation of what our hope is in. Who is it in? It's in Him. It is in Him. The Lord Jesus Christ, who as Scripture tells us, is our inheritance. One day, oh, we, 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 we talked about I'll fly away. And it's going to be right after that. One day we're going to stand before God. And as the old hymn says, our hope will be built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Because our inheritance is in the Lord, we must have faith. We can have faith in the fact that when God looks at us, when God looks at us, He's not going to see us. He does not see us as the wretched sinners that we are. Why? Because of us? No. He doesn't see us like that because He is looking at us through a very special filter. He is looking at us through the blood of Jesus Christ, who on the day that you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, on the day that you claimed His gift of forgiveness of your sins and the penalty of your sins, on that day you took a bath and were washed thoroughly clean in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you're here today and you've not been bathed in the blood of Jesus Christ, then you have no hope. And the only stock you can take of your situation is the fact that you are in a position where you're going to pay for those sins on your own. When you stand before God, He's not going to see you through the filter of Jesus Christ's blood. He's going to see you as the sinner that you are, a sin that must be paid for because He's a just God as much as He's a loving God. And He's going to look at you, and though it is going to break His heart, He's going to give you what you have chosen, and you are going to spend eternity in a place called hell paying for your sins. But praise God, it doesn't have to happen. Praise God, he desires it not that it happens to anyone. He doesn't want anyone to perish and experience that. He wants everyone to find redemption. He wants everyone to stand before him and allow him to see them through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it's then, it's then that we appear to him holy. We appear to him set apart. We appear to him whiter than snow. Amen? We've got our faith in that now. That is the hope we have. But here's the awesome part about the day when we fly away. The Bible makes it clear. We will no longer need faith. You want to know why? Because our faith 
will be made sight. We will see him. We will see him. Praise God for that. But until that day, what's the Bible tell us? Well, until that day, we have to put our faith in that hope. And therefore, if we truly have that faith, our actions will show it. You say, Pastor, faith and actions go together? Well, I don't say it. God says it. I simply repeat what he says. If you look at James 2.17, it lets us know faith without works is dead. You understand that, right? Faith without works is dead. Not because you were saved by your works, but because you were genuinely saved, if you genuinely have attained that faith, then you genuinely will reflect that faith by your works. And so therefore, if there is a faith claimed where there is no works to evidence that faith, that faith is in doubt, and that faith could be false. The Bible makes it clear that many are going to stand before the Lord having had a false faith based upon things that faith was not based upon. For by grace you have been saved through faith. But after we have been saved, the next verse down lets us know that we are His masterpiece created to do, saved to do, redeemed to do the actions, the works that He would have us to do. God has a specific work for you, Miss Jill. For me, for Miss Hazel, for Miss Polly, uh, for Mr. Doug, for all of us in here who claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, if we are truly His children, God has a specific actions for us to do, a specific plan for us to do. We have to remain faithful to that work. We have to remain faithful to what He's called us to do. We can't allow Satan to hinder it by false guilt. We can't do that. We've got to stay faithful. Got to act by Faith. Well, we got to stop making excuses. We got to take stock of the situation. We've got to act by faith. And now, the letter R, we must refocus daily. We must refocus daily to have a successful, fresh start today. And there might be some folks in here right now who need a fresh start today. If you're going to have a fresh start today, a mulligan, guess what you need to do about yesterday? Forget about it. Guess what you need to do about tomorrow? Don't think about it. I don't know why I'm using that high-pitched voice. I just decided to do it. You can forget about that too. (laughs) Paul makes it clear. Forgetting about those things that are behind. Forget them. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to take care of itself. Guess what? We can't do anything about yesterday and the mistakes we made except learn from it and move on. Glance at it to remind yourself of what you learned. We can't do anything about tomorrow because we don't even know if we're going to be here. I could be dead before this day is out. The rapture could happen before this day is out. And we would be worrying about something that's not even happened. That whole faith being made sight thing could happen within the next 20 minutes. And all that worry about tomorrow and next week and next year and next month, it was what? Useless. Useless. So we must every day get our focus on what is at hand, the task at hand. Today, this moment, living for God, learning God's word, living God's way, lighting God's world. That is on every bulletin every Sunday. It's kind of our mission statement for this church. We don't need to be worried about if we didn't do it yesterday. We don't need to be worried about if we're going to do it tomorrow. We need to be worried about today. We need to love God and love people today. We need to follow his word today. We need to be kind today. We need to avoid corrupt communication today. We need to bear the fruits of the spirit today. That should be the delight of our heart. We talked last week about what it means for God to delight in us. You want to know when God delights in us? When we delight in him. Because when we delight in Him, the Bible makes it clear. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself also in the Lord, (coughs) and He will give you the desires of your heart. We must desire Him. We must delight in Him above everything else. We must sacrifice ourselves. We have to put our focus on Him and our faith in Him. And when we are doing that, it shows that we are focused on delighting in 
him. And when we are focused on delighting in him, you can be absolutely assured that he is looking down on you and he is at delight with you. He always has a relationship with you. Let me not confuse you in that. I always have a relationship with my daughters, but it does not always mean that I am delighted in what they're doing. But if you want to make sure that God is delighted with your actions, that God is delighted with the way you're handling sin, that God is delighted with the way you're taking stock of the situation, that, you're, that God is being delighted by you acting in faith, then in everything, have your focus on and refocus daily on the fact that you want to be delighted with him. You're going to delight yourself in him. You're going to meditate on his word. You're going to not just read it, but you're going to live it. You're not going to just speak it. You're going to do it. (sighs) On a daily basis, we have to realize some critical things. We have to continue to refocus on who he is and who we're not. We have to continue to refocus on the fact that anything is possible with him and nothing but failure and defeat is possible without him. We have to continue to realize that through him, we are more than conquerors. But without him, we will be nothing but conquered. Refocus on the fact that with him, all things work together for good. But without him, nothing truly works. Refocus on the fact every day, we are his children. He loves us. And there is nothing we can do or say to change that. Maybe his delight in us but never his love for us. And last but certainly not least, we have to refocus daily on the fact that though we will go through a battle on a daily basis with sin, with the world, the flesh, and the devil, please know this. Refocus daily on the fact that we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. If we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are on the winning team. And our coach, the Lord Jesus Christ, is already wearing the victor's crown. Amen? Amen. That must be our focus. Last but certainly not least, we're going to sum up the fresh start message today. Completing our fresh start with the letter T. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. That is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Very direct, very simple but not easy. Now, for those of us who have taken at least one mulligan in our careers, let me tell you what usually most golfers desire. Most golfers desire that when they take a mulligan, it's not a wasted mulligan. What do you mean? Well, if you have a bad shot, you decide to use your mulligan, you're really hoping and praying that the next time you swing that club, it is a good or at least decent shot. You see, that's what we have to trust the Lord for. When we mess up and we use our spiritual mulligan, we have to have our trust in Him that if we will follow Him, He will keep us out of the spiritual sand trap. He will help us not have to use that mulligan again. But can I tell you something about God? He's a gentleman. He wants to help you. He desires that you don't fall into that spiritual sand trap or any other bunker of life. He desires for you to live His way, but He will not force it. Oh, he may use some forceful measures to get you to pay attention to him. But in the end, he will only help you if you will allow him to help you. He will only show you the way if you're willing to be shown. Psalms Psalms 25, 4 and 5, one of my favorite verses says this. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me. Your paths. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all day. Show me your way, Lord. Hear me, church. If that is our prayer, if that is 
the prayer of our hearts, then hear what God says. If we're willing to stop our excuses, if we're willing to take stock of situations and act by faith, if we're willing to refocus daily, if we are willing to put our trust totally in Him, we are guaranteed by God to experience the true and biblical success of the fresh start that He's willing to give. Do you need a mulligan today? If you need a spiritual mulligan today, my goal was to let you know that it was available and let you know what you have to do to claim it. To stay up to date on current events at the church, check service times, or if you have questions about the Bible, please visit us at lbchurch.com or call 740-678-2738. Thanks for listening.